Uh, now, please welcome tonight's panel. The panel is four doctors, all from different disciplines of medicine. Dr. Rajiv Ayas is a respirologist and with the UBC Hospital Sleep Disorders Program. Dr. Ken Jin, head of the Division of Cardiology at BGH. Dr. Jason Valerio, neurologist with expertise in the study of Parkinson's disease and concurrent sleep disorders. And Dr. Maureen uh, Ceresny, psychiatrist and co-director of the Sleep Disorders Program at UBC Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. Uh, your research focuses on public health and safety consequences of sleep apnea and sleep deprivation. And as we saw in the video, uh, sleep apnea is one of the most prevalent sleep disorders. What do we know about this disorder and how is it treated? Uh, yeah, thank you. And thanks to Dr. Fleetham for such a great presentation. And I think that a lot of what I'm going to say is reinforced by his um, talk as well. Uh, patients um, with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, basically what happens with them is when everybody goes to sleep at night, it's a time of relaxation, and that includes the muscles in the back of the throat. So in the vast majority of individuals, if they go to sleep at night, they can still breathe pretty well. The issue you get into is that in patients with sleep apnea, the throat gets quite lax at night and can basically obstruct. So what happens is that they don't get the oxygen and they can't release the carbon dioxide at night. In addition to this, this kind of self-asphyxiation basically wakes them up at night as well. And a lot of times people might not, be, might not remember themselves uh, waking up, but it's basically like someone going in there and shaking them awake many times per hour. Uh, the prevalence of sleep apnea is quite high. So in individuals over the age of 40, you're talking about 10% of men and about 5% of women. Probably about 80% of individuals with moderate to severe disease have actually not been diagnosed by their physician. Because of the poor quality sleep they get at night, uh, they usually present with quite uh, severe daytime tiredness. Their spouse says that they stop breathing at night, and they snore quite loudly. They have a markedly increased rate of occupational injuries as well as motor vehicle crashes as well. Uh, one of the issues is it's being increasingly recognized that the low oxygen levels at night and the uh, awakenings at night also predispose individuals to cardiovascular disease as well. So if you take an individual with untreated severe sleep apnea and you follow them over time, their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke goes up by about a factor of three compared to somebody without uh, sleep apnea. If they actually do get treated for their sleep apnea and if they're compliant with therapy, their risk of a heart attack or stroke is actually very similar to that of the regular population uh, as well. So I think that those are kind of the major uh, issues with respect to sleep apnea that, that you need to, uh, to understand. How is it properly diagnosed? There's a couple of different ways to diagnose it. Uh, obviously, uh, if someone watches you at night, you know, you can get a suspicion of the diagnosis. But usually what we want to do is get uh, a confirmatory test to kind of make sure before we commit somebody to therapy for the disease. And there's a few different ways to do it. Probably the best way or the gold standard is what we do at UBC where we have people sleep overnight and we put a bunch of wires on their head and I think some of you have probably gone through that as well. And we basically can monitor every, everything about you and can tell you exactly how bad your sleep apnea is. The issue that we've gotten into is that the sleep apnea is so common um, that it's, it's basically impossible to bring everybody in and to do that at, at UBC Hospital or, or the other sleep labs in BC. What we're starting to do more uh, in the US as well as in Canada is something called ambulatory studies where we're basically trying to study patients in their own home. So we'll send people home with equipment that may not be as, as comprehensive as the equipment that you have in the sleep lab, but it's actually enough for us to make the diagnosis, especially in patients with fairly substantial disease as well. And in someone with, with very characteristic symptoms and who has a study that's suggestive of that, we're usually okay with just going ahead and initiating therapy based on that information. Have you ever been through a sleep lab? Uh, I've been through uh, multiple studies. Uh, but more, I mean, more personally, have you been on the bed with all the wires? Uh, yes. Yes, I have a couple of times. Uh, again, they were more for research type of studies uh, when I was a fellow, and they were actually more in-depth than what people have experienced. The reason I ask is have. you're supposed to get a good night's sleep. Have you ever tried to sleep with all those electrodes? <laughs> yeah. 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 They wire you up. You've got, you've got leads for your heart. You've got leads on your head. It's on a bed that's mostly cardboard, and they say, <laughs> have a good night's sleep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the good thing is that everyone's in the same position, you know, when they come in. So when we look at the study, we take that into account uh, as well. But again, to a certain extent, that's why I think there is a push to actually study people in their own homes, because I think that that probably gets you a better idea of what their sleep is really like, as opposed to sort of our artificial type of environment as well. But I think that's an excellent point. Thank you, Dr. Ash. Next up is Dr. Ken Jin, who is the head of cardiology here at PGH, uh, served as the head of the UBC Division of Cardiology until 2012. Obviously, he's going to talk about heart health. Uh, Dr. Jin, how does sleep or lack of sleep affect our, our heart? 
Well, in terms of uh, amount of sleep, uh, you, we, we saw Dr. Fleetham's uh, slide. If you sleep less than six hours uh, a day, it increases your risk of heart attack. It doubles the risk of heart attack. So we know that the sleep amount is important. Uh, sleep apnea also affects the heart. So what happens when you, when you sleep, your nervous system turns off, so your blood vessels are supposed to relax, your heart rate drops, your blood pressure drops. But in people who have sleep apnea, the nervous system is turned on, and the blood pressure can actually rise. So we accept a blood pressure of 135 over 85 during the day, and at nighttime, your blood pressure is not supposed to be more than 115 over 75. But in people who have sleep apnea, the blood pressure is often higher during the night, and it stays high during the next day. So if you have high blood pressure, and you're not controlled on three pills, it's often due to sleep apnea. And if you get treated, your blood pressure comes under control. We find a lot of people have irregular heart rhythms. The worst one, what we see, the most common one, is called atrial fibrillation. The top part of the heart normally beats, then the bottom, regularly 60, 70, 80 beats per minute. But when you go into fibrillation, the top part uh, beats at four to 500 beats per minute. It can't beat that fast, so it just quivers. And when it when does that, clots can form and can go off the head and cause a stroke. So this uh, heart rhythm problem can, can, leads to stroke. It also leads to chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitations. So if you, especially if you have palpitations come on in the middle of the night when you have sleep apnea, it tells us that there's a very high likelihood that, that that's the underlying cause. So these things uh, can uh, be very common. Is there one particular sleep disorder that's perhaps more prevalent that contributes more to heart problems than another? Or well, sleep I think being the worst. Well, for society, I think lots of people don't get enough sleep. Uh, but sleep apnea is the one that we see that is. Uh, perhaps more easily treatable. And you know, there's some cases out there which are very simple. So I, I, I saw a patient, a 60-year-old man, who had a small heart attack. He uh, opened up, uh, his had, had his artery opened up. His heart was pumping normally. He was on minimal medications. Yet he complained of severe fatigue. And he actually, uh, I was of the third opinion. And two previous cardiologists said, your heart's good, you shouldn't be feeling tired. Well, the answer was right. Those cardiologists were right. But the patient was 240 pounds, had a neck that was 17, and he had sleep apnea. So uh, he got treated and came back and said, I feel like a million bucks, I feel 20 years younger. That's not an atypical story. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think all cardiologists or all family physicians are tuned into this possibility. Uh, another patient who had this atrial fibrillation, this irregular heartbeat, it's hard to control sometimes. And the patient was on the best medications we could have, still having quite a bit of palpitations, still very symptomatic. And when we put the patient on CPAP to treat their sleep apnea, there was a dramatic decrease in the number of palpitations they had. And the studies show that if you get treated, there's about a 50% reduction in the irregular heartbeats. So treatment can be very effective. Thank you, Doctor. Next up is Dr. Jason Valeria, who's a neurologist who's Research examines Parkinson's disease and the concurrent sleep disorders. Now, Dr. Valeri is also a clinical staff member at the UBC Hospital's uh, Sleep Disorders Clinic and the Pacific Parkinson's Research Center Movement Disorders Clinic. Uh, doctor, I'm fascinated by this. How does sleep impact the health of our brain? Um, thanks, Rick. So, <clears throat> it's a good question. People are always asking me, how does, or what is the purpose of sleep? And Big picture, we don't know, but we have some insights in terms of um, some more recent research. And one of those is over the last two years, people have um, come to realize that the brain actually clears itself from neurotoxins that build up through the day. And so as these neurotoxins build up, we have increased inflammation and other metabolic processes that build up. And the easiest way to think about it is that you're, it's like taking out the garbage at night. While you sleep, your brain becomes a little bit more porous and it drains out of um, a, certain, a very specific circulatory system. So there's a lymphatic system in the body and just two years ago we just realized that there's a lymphatic system of the brain as well. So the thought is that if you have good quality sleep, you're going to be draining out a lot of these toxins. And we've extrapolated this and many people think that 
these, the buildup of these proteins can cause Alzheimer's disease as well as Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. So that's one of the that's one of the reasons why um, sleep is important, I think. Uh, Dr. Fleetham referred to something called REM, REM behavior disorder. Um, how is REM sleep and the behavior disorder, how is that connected to Parkinson's? So as uh, Dr. Fleetham showed, there was there's about, um, now we know, an 80 to 90% risk of developing Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism if you have um, established REM behavior disorder. And so this is an entity where you will act out your dreams. It's very different than sleepwalking or sleep talking, which we see more often in uh, younger individuals. This is typically in older individuals, and it is clearly acting out of dreams or vocalizing in the middle of the night. And we know that it's probably one of the earliest signs of um, a collection, again, of the proteins and of developing Parkinsonism. And we also know that um, there can be some delay when you see the REM behavior disorder to actually developing Parkinson's disease. And up to 30 years, um, some of the literature supports in terms of the delay. So the disease process starts much earlier before we actually start seeing the classic motor symptoms, which are the tremor, the slowing, and the uh, rigidity. And in layman's terms, can you explain rapid eye movement, REM, because uh, a lot of doctors have said um, to get a good night's sleep, you have that REM, that rapid eye movement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep is just a, one of the stages of sleep. We have um, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage three is slow wave sleep. We know that's important for consolidating memories and screening growth hormone and other important aspects of brain health. REM sleep itself also helps consolidate or develop different types of memories, so it's important in that sense. And it tends to happen later on in the uh, nighttime period. So it's just another stage of sleep and it's more um, associated with dreaming and they call it dream sleep. You likely do dream in all stages of sleep, but this is where you have your clear dreams that you have a better recollection of. Fascinating. Our final panelist is Dr. Marie uh, Ceresny, who is a psychiatrist and co-director of the Sleep Disorders Program at UBC. Uh, doctor, the connection between sleep and psychiatric disorders. Yeah, I just want to say thanks everybody for coming. It's a fabulous turnout. Um, yeah, in, in our clinic we have sort of a couple of different streams that we do. We have people who deal mostly with uh, respiratory sleep illness and then we have the rest of us who deal with it, pretty much anything but. And uh, so our group of psychiatrists see a lot of sleep disorders that are related to mental health trouble like anxiety and depression and so forth, but it comes on as a symptom of those conditions. We also know now that there's a connection in the other direction, so that people who have poor sleep are at higher risk of developing, uh, for example, a mood disorder like depression uh, as time goes on. And, and this has been shown even in young people and teenagers uh, that they're at higher risk of anxiety and depression if they've had trouble sleeping. Uh, sometimes there's also uh, side effects from different medications that we use that can cause trouble with people's sleep, that can cause insomnia, or that can cause daytime sleepiness. And then some of the medications we use in mental health can cause things like weight gain that might predispose someone to sleep apnea. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a complex, uh, a complex connection. What are, what are some of the factors and lifestyle changes that contribute to good sleep? Well, I think Dr. Fleetham kind of stole the thunder on that one a little bit. I mean, he's gone over a lot of the things. He's like I, that. I, <laughs> he's like that. No, he, he, he's a smart guy. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, but no, the, the thing that really um, I think is important for us is to really give sleep the attention that it deserves. We don't tend to, in our busy society, take care of ourselves very well. And I see that a lot, too, in, in working parents, you know, people with little kids. It seems like mom and dad often come last. In terms, of, in terms of taking care of their health. So I really encourage people to dedicate time and space to the sleep and to make sure that you give yourself time to put the day to rest, to wind down, to just have a little bit of time, even if it's five minutes, to take a few deep breaths and just 
relax before you before you try to go to sleep. And I, I'm on the same page as what Dr. Fleetham was saying in terms of you know putting putting the blue screens away, take the the smartphones out of the bedroom, the TVs, all of that stuff that's you know promoting mental alertness. It really doesn't belong in the bedroom. It should really be a place for rest and relaxation. Uh, also, you know things like cardiovascular exercise for so many reasons so good for you. Um, it has been shown to help improve the depth and quality of sleep, which is really important.